Okay, so functional localization. Specific areas of the brain control specific functions. For example, let's say you have a massive stroke, blood clot, hemorrhage in this left frontal area, right here. Or let's say somebody shot you with a gun and blew out part of your left frontal lobe, or somebody beat you over the head with a cloth hammer and tore out this part of your brain, this left frontal area here. What would happen? you would lose the ability to speak. You would lose the ability to talk. You would not be able to repeat sentences. You wouldn't be able to repeat what you read. You wouldn't be able to say your own name. You would develop what's called expressive aphasia. And that's with damage to this particular area. You would develop expressive aphasia, meaning that you wouldn't be able to talk. So you would get what's called expressive aphasia. You wouldn't be able to talk. You wouldn't be able to say anything. You wouldn't be able to tell me your name. And it's a classic condition called aphasia, A-P-H-A-S-I-A, -A, aphasia. Also called expressive aphasia. Expressive meaning you can't express yourself. It's also called, it's a word right here, this is broca. It's also called broca, broca's aphasia because a doctor by the name of broca, about 150 years ago, is the one who discovered that Everybody that lost the ability to speak, whose brains he took out of their heads, had damage in this area, so it's also called Broca's area. It's in this general vicinity. Okay, so if this left frontal area got damaged, had a stroke, and people have strokes here. You get grandpa, 60, 70, or grandma, 60, 70, actually even babies can have strokes in this area of the brain, or damage to the area. So you would get what's called expressive aphasia. You wouldn't be able to talk. You wouldn't be able to say anything. You wouldn't be able to tell me your name. And it's a classic condition called aphasia, A-P-H-A-S-I-A, -A, aphasia. This is a classic sign of aphasia, also of brain damage, even tumors, but in particular stroke, lose the ability to speak. However, although you couldn't speak, you'd still be able to swear. You'd be able to swear, damn it, you'd still be able to sing. In fact, you would be able to sing words that you can't say. And you would be able to pray. Now I lay me down to sleep, or whatever prayer you know. Amazingly, people with broca's aphasia, with expressive aphasia, with damage to this left frontal area, retain the ability to sing, swear, pray, even though with massive damage, they can't talk. The reason being, now we're looking at the right, the right, like so, open it up, frontal lobe. It turns out that the ability to sing and swear and pray is mediated by, by this area here. So this left front over here is the one that does the talking that says the words, and this part over here is doing the singing and the praying and the swearing. Have you ever had the experience where you've said to somebody or they said to you, it's not what you said, it's the way you said it. I didn't like that sarcasm in your voice. I don't like that tone of voice. It's this area that's producing the melody, the emotion to your voice. Most of you haven't had this experience because you're too young, but if, uh, say, a couple years from now, you go into a bar, nightclub, standing there at the bar, Somebody taps you on the shoulder, standing behind you, they say the words, do you want to go outside? Do you want to go outside? When you listen to that, it could mean a lot of different things. Depending on the melody, the emotion of the voice, it could mean that I'm going to punch you in the nose. You want to go outside? Or you want to go outside, maybe you have a cigarette, or you're talking to potential pickup. Hey, you want to go outside? All the types of tones and melody of voice tells you. So when the person taps you on the shoulder and says to you, do you want to go outside? You know you're going to go outside, but you also know what might happen. You understand what the person has in mind. They're going to make moves on me. They're going to offer me some nice surprise. Or are they just tired of being here because they're flirting with X, Y, and Z, and now they want to leave? It's that melody, sarcasm, what have you. So it turns out these two areas of the brain work together to produce language. It's a real neat little system. 
whoever invented this did a good job. These two interact together. So this part is saying the words, and this part is putting the emotion and the melody. So if you wanted to say something, you're with your, your honey. Oh, I love you. I love you so much. How do you know I love you? Okay? <laughs> it's that emotion, that melody, all of that is the right frontal area. So these two areas of the brain work together at the same time to produce complex speech. And they're called speech areas. So we have all these different areas, uh, names for Broca's area, expressive aphasia, but they're called speech areas. There's a left frontal speech area, right frontal speech area, and it turns out there's these little neurons, cell bodies, everybody's taken intro to the site, right? They know what I'm talking about, little cell bodies here, and the cell bodies have these axons, long cable, we'll just call it a cable right now, like electrical wire going across so it's over here, over here, and they just send these fibers across to make connections so they can work together to, to produce complex speech. If it turned out that you had massive damage in this right frontal area, you'd still be able to speak, but the melody, the emotion would be gone. Or it would be distorted, it would sound funny. You wouldn't be able to sing, even in the shower you'd sound terrible, with that right frontal type of damage. If instead your massive damage was here, in the left temporal area, left temporal area, massive damage, you shot in the head, somebody beats you, you have massive blowout of some blood vessels, massive stroke, this area here damages, gets damaged and dies, you would lose the ability to understand anything I'm saying to you. Your ability to understand anything I'm saying would be gone. This is called receptive aphasia. Receptive aphasia. Receptive meaning receiving. Aphasia, like there's expressive aphasia, receptive aphasia, so it's an important word. So we know this left temporal area here when somebody says to you, do you want to go outside, what happens is the information goes in your ear, goes in your brainstem, goes to another structure in the thalamus, it goes to what we call, goes into the auditory area, and then it's transferred to Wernicke's area, where it's analyzed, the speech sounds. When I'm talking to you, there are punctuations temporal sequences in the words. When we read words, we look at their spaces between them. Even a single word, September, has all these different parts. Now, complex language, I'm talking really fast, I'm saying all these different words here, you're all listening to me right now, I'm trying to put together what I'm trying to say to you and put it together in your head. That's pretty fast information coming in. You're able to pick up some of it. What happens is information comes in, stores a little bit of it, analyzes the sequences, puts the grammar together, do you want to go outside? Meaning, do you want to go outside? It's the want outside go. Anyway, if this area, again, we're just doing overview today, this area is damaged, you're going to completely lose the ability to understand anything I'm saying to you. You wouldn't be able to read. If I showed you something and you tried to read it, you wouldn't be able to repeat it. And this kind of disorder, it often fools doctors, family members, sometimes with damage to that area, they might think the patients become schizophrenic. I'll explain why in a moment. I think they might become psychotic. Here we have again, left half of the brain. Left half of the brain. Here's our Broca's area, doing the expressive speech. Here's the primary auditory area, analyzes all the sequence of sounds, breaks them apart, and it's the Wernicke's area which then analyzes the language. And let's say I told you, say after me, I love red pencils. And here and here, I love red pencils, and the information is actually a fiber bundle, group of axons, bring it to here, and it comes out here. And the mouth area is located here in the motor area. I love green pencils, or whatever color I said, and then you can repeat it. This area is destroyed. Every bit of information it transmits 
is also going to be abnormal. But if it starts talking, it's going to say a lot of nonsense. This is a patient I examined. And this is them, uh, I recorded them talking during the examination, and this is them talking to me. Oh yeah, that was a long time ago. That was when, that was before, that was before I even knew that much about this place. Although I'm a little suspicious about what the hell is the part. There's one part around here, there's part scares, the state spares. Okay, that has a bunch of drives in it. A bunch of good gogging. If you keep reading here, when they brought this patient in, he's talking like this all the time. And they thought maybe he's schizophrenic. Maybe he developed schizophrenia and he's saying all this bizarre stuff. Because even when you would talk to him and try to explain to him that what he's saying, he's not responding to what's being said to him. He had vernicus aphasia. He had a massive stroke in vernicus area. So suddenly all this, when he's talking, it's just nonsense. This is called fluent aphasia. Receptive aphasia, vernicus aphasia, can also give rise to fluent aphasia, so whatever you're saying is nonsense. And again, you can't tell the person. Hey, you know, you didn't make any sense? Oh, one part of Sparks Bear is locked on the next one for an arm. I'm just going to say the word, you don't have to learn it today, it's called adnose agnosia. Agnosia. Nosia, G-N, nosia, Gnostic, means to know. Agnosia means not to know. Phasia, phonate, aphasia, not to. Okay. Agnosia, nosia. What this means, a person with vernicus aphasia, with damage in this area, that doesn't understand anything that you're saying, because this area analyzes language, it doesn't know that it doesn't know. It doesn't know that it's not understanding. It doesn't know that. Because this is the area of the brain that analyzes language. So the person is trying to have a conversation, they're not going to know anything's wrong with them. Uh, this was back when I was at Yale. I had gone in and examined a woman that had a massive left cerebral stroke. I determined after about 20 minutes that she had Wernicke's aphasia receptive aphasia. And we have to do rounds, meaning that all the doctors get together and the interns go over the patients. And I announced that the person had uh, Wernicke's aphasia. And one of the other interns said, no, that's not true. You're wrong. Made a big mistake, which you don't want to do in front of all, all the doctors there. He said, I talked to her this morning. I asked her how she was. And she said she was fine. I go, no, she's got She's got Wernicke's aphasia, that she said she's fine doesn't mean anything. Go brought her up. I said to her, it's cold today. She goes, fine, fine. What she did, is she listened to the emotion, the melody in my voice and my facial expression, and it turns out that the right temporal area, this is the area that perceives music, melody, emotion. So when the person says to you, do you want to go outside, it's this part, the right temporal area, which is analyzing all the emotional qualities and the social qualities, the emotional and the musical parts of language. So the brain works really neat together. You've got the two left frontal areas expressing together, and you have the two temporal areas also locked together, interacting with one another. So the left is hearing these words, and the right is hearing the sarcasm or the love or the anger and what have you. So in any case, this woman still had, still had uh, Wernicke's aphasia, but she was able to get along partly well because she could still pick up on the emotion, the music. You see somebody come up, even if they're speaking another language to you, you might be able to figure out what they're saying to you. There's a saying from an old movie. These guys are like surrounded by all these people with spears and weapons, and one turns the other, he goes, I don't know what they're saying, but I sure don't like the sound of it. The sound of it, the melody, okay, the perceived danger. Somebody smiling to you, you know, in the street corner asking you for money, but the tone of their voice, the melody, tells you you're in danger. So the right temporal area is perceiving the music, the melody, the emotion. And of course, at the right temporal area, that's where you had your massive damage. 
you would lose the ability to perceive emotion, melody, music, everything would sound like rap music. Okay, with right temporal lobe damage, what might happen though? You have right temporal lobe damage, you still speak, what you're saying your voice might sound a little odd, the emotion in your voice might sound strange, but one problem you're going to have, let's say you're sitting with your lover, and they're telling you how much they love you, you're not going to hear it. So I hear you saying it, but I just don't feel it. I hear you saying you love me, but I just don't feel it. I don't feel like you really mean it. Because the ability to perceive all those nuances is made possible by this area of the brain. If you can't figure out what the other person's feeling, uh, that could be very confusing, and uh, it could lead to paranoia as well. Paranoia, because suddenly you're going home, and your husband, wife, children don't sound the same. They look the same, they're talking the same, they're saying the words, but I think they've been replaced by an imposter. And yes, this happens with right temporal lobe damage. I think they've been replaced by an imposter because of the way they're talking. I can tell the way the sound of the voice, there's something different about them. So yeah, you can give rise to paranoia and depression because picking up on these nuances is a big part of life. Occipital lobe. Occipital lobe receives all the visual input after it's been analyzed in the thalamus, after it's been analyzed in the brainstem, and it goes here to the occipital lobe into the visual cortex. It's analyzed. If you had massive damage, massive stroke, say you're shot, you fall off and bang your head on the cement, crush this area, massive damage here, you would be blind. If it's both halves of the brain, you would be blind. Even though you could still see and your eyes are responding, you would be blind, but you wouldn't know you're blind. You wouldn't know it. Because this is the area of the brain that sees. Because this is the area that analyzes visual information. Consider, consider a person who's born blind. They wouldn't know they're blind, because they never had any sight. Think of creatures born 100 miles below the ocean surface in some cave where there's no light, they don't evolve eyes. Okay. If this area is the visual area analyzes visual input, and if you get rid of that area, the visual area doesn't know that it's not seeing because it doesn't exist anymore. And this is one of the interesting things about brain damage is you can have damage and you won't even know that you're damaged. If it's broke as aphasia, yeah, you'll know because Vernica's area is listening to the way I, I'm not making any, I can't speak can't speak down it. But if Wernicke's area is gone, they wouldn't know. If Wernicke and the left frontal was gone, massive stroke, they couldn't speak and they wouldn't understand and they wouldn't even know anything was wrong. Right visual area, right occipital lobe perceives left half of space. The right half of your brain controls the left half of your body. If you had damage just in the right occipital lobe, massive damage. You would lose all vision from the left visual field. So wherever you look, the left would be gone. You still wouldn't know you were blind. You still wouldn't know it. In fact, you would bump into things. In fact, people with cortical blindness, I was trying to give the example, if they're cortically blind, you say, how many fingers am I holding up? They'll give you an answer, three. Oh, well, that's not right. Oh, well, uh, five, maybe five fingers. No, I'm not holding up any fingers. Oh, well, it's a little dark. That's why I didn't see. And then they move around, and they're knocking into things and tripping, and you go, can you see okay? Yeah, I can see fine. I can see fine. Well, then why are you tripping into things? Well, I, it's a little dark. I'm not familiar with the room. This is called confabulation. A person will make up explanations for why this is happening. What's Giving the explanation, the language area of the brain. The language area of the brain is talking, and it's trying to tell you what's going on in the visual area, but the language area doesn't analyze vision. So you're talking to just part of the brain there. 
confabulation is something we all do all the time to varying degrees. Try to explain our own behavior, why we did, what we said, why this happened. And we'll go into that in greater detail. It's an attempt to fill in the blanks and to make sense of, uh, of the world. But we're talking about unusual conditions here. And if the area of the brain that controls language, that perceives language is gone, then it's not going to know that it's not perceiving language. If the area that analyzes the visual input is gone, it's not going to know that it's blind and will make up reasons. OK, I'll give you an example. This is an actual experiment, a very famous experiment by two guys named Nesbitt and Wilson. Maybe we can repeat this experiment, but what they did they went to the supermarket, they laid out four identical nylon stockings. Identical. And then they asked people preference tests. Tell me which one you like. Which one do you like best? So people would come up and they feel the different ones and they pick the one on the right. I like this one. Why do you like it? Oh, the color. Experiment switched them around. Next person come up, feel, 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 pick the one on the right. I like this one. Why? Oh, the color. Experimenters switch it around. Next person pick, 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 pick the one on the right. Why do you like this one? Oh, it's softer. 80% of the people they tested picked the item on their right. Everybody had an explanation, but not a single explanation was right. All the answers were wrong because they were identical. It turns out, just like I'm moving mostly to my right hand, most people have a right-sided response bias. Not everybody, but they're more likely. Brand X on TV, they're usually going to put that to the left. They know this. Not everybody, but most people have right-sided response bias. This is an example of confabulation. Why did you pick that? Oh, the color, the texture. They make up an explanation, and humans do this all the time. Why did you spend the night with that person last night? Oh, I had too much to drink, and, and on and on and on. All these explanations as to what happened. Okay? People do this all the time. They make up explanations for their behavior, and then they believe it. So this is normal. We also can call it self-deception fool ourselves into believing things that aren't true. So confabulation is an extreme form of this where a person could be blind and it's called denial of blindness. Denial of blindness. And the person will not know they're blind, just like they won't know that they have receptive aphasia. They get no message at all, so they fill in the blank. But the thing is, the rest of the brain is not being told it can't see. Because the part that would tell it, the visual area, is not there anymore. So the rest of the brain doesn't get that information. It's not told, hey, I can't see. Instead, it, it's trying to figure out why it's bumping into. And the only information it doesn't have is why it can't see. So it's not given that information. So it has to make with the information. Why am I bumping? Well, it must be dark. If you can't experience it, you well, can't know about it. it. Yeah. Well, you, have you don't know that you don't know. That's the other thing, is you don't know that you don't know. In this area right here, it's called the parietal lobe. Okay, here's your frontal lobe, temporal lobe, occipital lobe. Here's your parietal lobe. And your parietal lobe, just like this area gets visual input, this area gets auditory input, this area here gets input from your entire body, from your tendons, even from some of the muscles. All this information is being projected to neurons lying across the surface of this area of the brain. But the body, so the entire body, in fact the body is represented several times, overlapping imaging. But the body is represented, sensory, the physical sensation is represented in accordance with the importance of that body part. What I mean by that, by that, for example, the elbow, not real important in terms of sensory sensation, so there's not too much area devoted to the elbow. Lips, yes, great big huge area devoted to lips, great big area devoted to the hands because of the importance of the hand and feeling objects and and the mouth and tasting objects. So we see that the areas of the brain are represented in accordance with their sensory importance. This is a figure from Penfield. It's both the motor and sensory. What Penfield did, he was a neurosurgeon, cut open the brain, electrode, touched different parts, asked people what they feel. So he actually mapped out the brain. And just like I said, a huge area here devoted to the hand. Because the hand is a lot more important than the toes. Lips, 
because the lips are so important in terms of, I mean, not just kissing, but in eating, talking, moving the lips. So a huge area here is devoted to the mouth and the hand. The entire body is represented on the surface of the parietal lobe. Sensory, so all sensory information. If, if you had a massive stroke that destroyed this area, you would lose all sensation of the left half of your body. So we're talking about the right parietal lobe. Because the whole body is represented there. If we had massive damage in this area, your entire map, entire sensation of your body, your entire image of your body would disappear. And because you would lose all awareness of the left half of your body, you would no longer know you have a left half of your body. Patients have had this happen. Go to the hospital, they complain. There's somebody else in my bed at night. How do you know that? Well, they keep bumping into their hand and feeling them. This is called, words called neglect, or hemi neglect, hemi half, hemi neglect. I'll give you an example from a patient, a patient I saw. A person had massive right parietal lobe damage. I go into their room, they've got their hair combed on the right side. She had her lipstick on and makeup on the right half of her body. She had her hand, arm through part of her clothes on the right hand side. But the left, no makeup, hair wasn't, and her arms just hanging there limp. Okay, so I, I go into and examine her. Please raise your right hand. Okay, now I want you to raise your left hand. She raised her right hand. I go, no, no, no. That's your right hand. I want you to raise your left hand. She can still talk, because the left half of her brain is fine. The left half has the right half of the body. So she's moving it around. So I go, can you raise your left hand? She goes, well, I did, doctor. I raised my left hand. I go, no, no, no. That's your right hand. I want you to raise your left hand. Can you raise your left hand? And again, she said, I go, no, no, no. And I reach down, I pick up her hand. I go, I want you to raise this hand. Can you raise this hand? And she looks down at it. She goes, that's not my hand. I go, sure it is. That's your hand. She goes, no, it's not mine. I go, yeah, this is your hand. Look at it. This is your hand. She goes, no, it's not my hand. It's not mine. I go, well, whose is it then? She goes, well, maybe it's yours. I go, no, no, I already got two hands. <laughs> so I hold up the hand some more. And I go, take a look at this hand. Don't you recognize it? She goes, no, that's not my hand. I don't know why you're doing this and telling me this. I go, look there at that big, huge stone on your... And she goes, my wedding ring. Somebody stole my wedding ring. Classic syndrome. She no longer recognized the left half of her body. And even when you showed it to her, she did not know it was her left of her body because the whole area of the brain that perceives and analyzes information about the left half of the body is gone. Think of this. Fish has no hands. Can a fish recognize that it has no hands? No, because it doesn't have an area of the brain that would analyze hand information, whereas you do. So when that area is gone, you're like any other species that wouldn't have hands and wouldn't be able to recognize the left half of your body. And these people, if you ask them to draw, they'll only draw on the right hand side. If you ask them to eat, they'll only eat on the right hand side. Yes, you can have partial damage. And partial damage could be, that, for example, you put something in their hand and they can't recognize it. Or you touch, touch their hand and they don't know you're touching them. But they might still be able to recognize it's their hand. So if the brain area that controls, that perceives the left half of the body is not there, then the rest of the body, brain, can't be told about it. Bring us to the end of our lecture for today. Is here we have again left half of the brain. Left half of the brain. Here's our Broca's area doing the expressive speech. Here's the primary auditory area analyzes all the sequence of sounds, breaks them apart, and it's a word, Wernicke's area, which then analyzes the language. I want you to all 
pay attention to this one very important area of the brain. This whole area right here is called the inferior parietal lobule. Inferior parietal lobule. And inferior parietal lobule is unique to primates. We're primates, so we're monkeys, or so apes. But it's unique to primates have this inferior parietal lobule. So it's something recently evolved. But in humans, there's yet another structure even more unique called the angular gyrus. And you only find it in humans. Only find it in humans. Now, this is conveniently located, so it sits at the junction of vision and body sensation and auditory input. This recently evolved tissue, unique to primates, unique to humans, sits at the junction of the visual, auditory, and parietal area, which means, well, here's how things work. Simple visual input comes here, primary area, then it goes to the association area, which puts different visual input together. So it can be recognized, for example, as a ball, or a cup, or a pen. But let's say that you wanted to name it. Well, it goes to here. And what happens is that you see the visual image of the pen, and I say, what is it? And you're able to take the auditory information and match it to the visual. So you're able to say, when I hold this up, what is this? It's glasses, sunglasses. What if instead I put it in your hand and you're feeling it? Okay, you're feeling the sensation. It goes up to here, hand area, feels it, tr transmits it to here. What am I holding? Well, you might be able to visualize it. Why could you visualize it? You can create, call forth a visual image of this because of this area. So I can feel it in my hand, and then I can visualize what it might look like. And with my eyes closed, I can also call up the auditory equivalent to go, it feels like a pen, it's a pen. Okay? So here's the neat little way the brain is organized so that visual input comes here, tactual here, auditory here, and this area makes it possible for us to have complex concepts and the miracle of human language. To be able to speak in all these different categories, to say something like book and think of all kinds of books and words and what it sounds like, etc. If I said to you, pen, image here, so you can visualize, all made possible by this area of the brain. If your stroke was right here, cut off, you can see it, you wouldn't be able to tell me what it is. You can see it. What is this? Well, the visual input, even though you can see it, even though you can show me what to do with it, if it's cut off from here, you're not going to be able to say the word pen. You're not going to be able to do it. You would not. It's, it's, it's a, 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 a thing, a thing, a, the, the, the writer thing. It's a, you wouldn't be able to come up with the, with the name. If there's massive damage here, You ask the auditory brain, area of the brain, why can't you, uh, why are you stumbling around? Are you blind? Well, you can't get that information. It just doesn't have access to that. The part that knows it's blind is back here. This part just does the talking. So it's the talking part of the brain, and it pulls together all the associations available to it. What is not available is I'm blind. But a lot of other explanations, maybe it's dark, you know, all these different reasons, uh, it's the color, it's the texture. We do this all the time. If you, don't have, if you don't have access to the information, humans are really great at making up an explanation and then believing it. And what it's called is you fill the gap. And if the gap is really big, then you fill it up with really big nonsense. I was talking about language 
and we talked about word finding difficulty. This nomia, a nomia. You're asked for a word. I, I know what it is. I know. You know what it is, but consciously, you don't know what it is. There's different aspects of consciousness. But one aspect of consciousness is associated with language. You might think in verbal thoughts. We think in words. We talk about things. So when you can't find the word, you know it's there. So you can say, well, it's pre-conscious. It's outside of linguistic consciousness. It's outside the language areas of conscious. But we have evidence right there of the conscious mind, that part being associated with language, going, uh, I, I know what it is, but I can't find it. But there's a knowledge that it's there. So where, where is the word? It's not conscious, but it's not completely unconscious either. So we can say, well, it's pre-conscious or just outside consciousness. So we know from everyday experience that there are things that are outside of the language-dependent aspects of consciousness. Talked a lot about language for that reason is that there's aspects of conscious mind that are associated with language. There's sex differences too. Sex differences in the brain. Everywhere we look in the brain, there's sex differences. Just like there's sex differences in the body, there's sex differences in the brain. Every area of the brain we look at, we can tell there's a female pattern, male pattern, and in some areas there's also homosexual pattern. Turns out that's in the limbic system, the part controlling sexuality. There's actually a homosexual pattern of how the brain is organized. Yes, almost every region of the brain you look at, there's sex differences. But in these particular structures here, in the hypothalamus and the amygdala, and there's a pathway that links the two amygdala, in, the, in females, that pathway is actually enlarged, and in homosexual males, it's even larger. Limbic system controls all aspects of emotion, including social, emotional behaviors. So the limbic system here is like your basic and conscious of these emotional impulses, sexual impulses, desire for food, etc. It's all arising in this limbic system, which we're going to say is basically like the id, the, the most deepest levels of the unconscious mind. All these impulses, the impulses, if you're angry at somebody, if you're hungry, if you want sex, it's all happening right here in the limbic system. Now, what makes us different from other species is not only do we have neocortex, just like chimpanzees, just like other mammals, but we have an area of the brain called the frontal lobe. The frontal lobe is the senior executive of the brain and personality. It's this massive inhibitor that inhibits the rest of the brain. If we look at... Uh, over the course of evolution, and I don't like that word, but we'll use it anyway. We look over the course of evolution, we find you get up to chimpanzees, their brain is very similar. If you look at, take it out of the skull and look at, it's very similar to a human, except for, well, one, they don't have an angular gyrus. But the other is the frontal lobe. This part of the brain is not well developed. Which is why female chimp, female goes in the estrus in the heat, well, he's going to go over there and have sex with her. He's not going to think about right or wrong or ask her for a date. Uh, though he might offer her flowers. He might even offer her meat in exchange for sex. So there is a little bit of thinking frontal lobe activity. In any case, the frontal lobe actually evolved out of the, out of the limbic system. Part of it actually evolved out of the limbic system and has massive interconnections with the limbic system, in particular an area of the frontal lobe called the orbital frontal lobe. The orbital frontal lobe. And the reason it's called orbital is because it sits above the orbits of the eyes. Okay. So massive amount of frontal tissue here, an actual outgrowth, and then we have more frontal area here. Frontal lobe, I said, is the senior executive of the brain and personality. It's like the conscience, as in the, let your conscience be your guide. It's the part of the brain 
that thinks about morals, that anticipates consequences, which can plan for the future and think about multiple possibilities about the future. All this by this massive structure here, the senior executive brand personality. But one thing the frontal lobe does is it inhibits. It inhibits the rest of the brain. This is what I mean when I say it's like the super ego in the Freudian sense. It actually inhibits the rest of the brain. So, the male limbic system sees that female that's dressed provocatively and the limbic system says, hey, go, go do it. But the frontal lobe will say, no, we'll stop that behavior because it can think about the consequences or I might get arrested. But because it can think and plan for the future, it might instead ask her if she'd like to have coffee and then take her on a date. So it plans the strategy for seduction, thinking about the consequences. You want to be on a diet, you see food, it might be your frontal lobe which will help you control that behavior. So the frontal lobe is like this massive inhibitor inhibiting the rest of the brain. You have these feelings, these emotions, but that sensor, and what is that sensor? It's your right and left frontal lobe actually inhibiting. These are all these fiber bundles. Look where they're all going. From the temporal lobe, occipital lobe, prior lobe, they're all flowing to the frontal lobe. They're all flowing to the frontal lobe. You have all this massive amount of information is going to the frontal lobe. Now, all this sensory stimuli, as we sit here, there's a feeling of the chair against your buttocks, feeling of your socks, your shoes, your coat. There's other sounds in this room. There's other visual stimuli. And what the frontal lobe does is actually acts at the other levels of the neocortex to prevent that information, prevent you from being overwhelmed. It actually stops it so the information gets up to the neocortex and stops it at that level. Otherwise, if you had damage from a lobe, you might be distracted, you might be hyperactive, you might start talking, anything comes to your mind, you might say. So the frontal lobes actually is regulating the rest of the brain to prevent you from being overwhelmed by all this other stimuli. The ability to, be, to focus on what I'm saying, to pay attention and focus on that, is made possible by your frontal lobe. Certain impulses arise, and perhaps they're unacceptable. It's a memory being regurgitated. It can actually be inhibited, so it's completely unconscious. You might feel something agitated for some reason, but not know why. Maybe your sexual desire, maybe you're angry, maybe you're hungry, but you don't know why. You just have some symptom. Frontal lobe being an outgrowth, limbic system, can actually inhibit actually acts as that sensor, inhibiting that impulse before it gets to the, the conscious mind. 